March the 8th, 2024. Guys, you're looking at a live portal from CERN. You can see the timestamp at the top as it ticks by. They crank back up for 2024. They've been shut down, I think, since November of last year. They usually do that in the winter. And when they CERN first cranked up, they were forced to do it in the winter because they drained so much energy from the surrounding cities that uh, they couldn't use their heat. <laughs> That's how much energy this thing uses. But uh, they are still doing it, so I assume it's for the same reason. I'm not sure if they have developed external power supplies or an internal possibly nuclear, uh, small nuclear plant to run this massive power eater or not. Anyway, it's back up. What you're looking at in the chart here is three lines of black, which indicates total power. And what they've tried to do with this black line is get it up to around 7,000 GeV or giga electron volts, which equals 7 TeV or tera electron volts. And so that's each beam, red beam, and the blue beam, guys, they collide in this massive underground tunnel situation. It's a big loop. You collide the red and blue beams, and you try to bring that power up. Again, they want 7,000 giga electron volts or 7 tera electron volts per beam and collide and reach uh, luminosity at around 13.5 or 14 tera electron volts. That's what they strive for every year. Now, remember, we have watched in the past several years when they reach high power that we see effects on our magnetopause. That particular model no longer is up that we used at that time. It's getting harder and harder to find those for some reason. But again, we, I want you to understand what we're dealing with because this is going to lead into a video I've been working on for, for quite a few weeks now. But anyway... We're dealing with CERN. We're dealing with a 17-mile underground loop where they collide these things. And what they have to do is keep the magnets in this large underground um, collider. And to achieve this power, they have to use what's called cryogenics. And let's look at that portal into their live uh, setup now. Again, this is live. Look at your timestamp in the top right. What you're seeing is different sections of this large underground tunnel. Each one has uh, different sensors. Each one has to keep everything very cold. Again, below 2 degrees Kelvin, which you're talking very cold, guys. We'll look at that in some of the technical information in this video. What you're looking at the bottom, though, is temperature in Kelvin. And what they've got to keep this down to is about 1.7 or 1.9, slightly under that to get full power. Notice two sections are red, and this has to do with Atlas. And um, that means that it's not cold enough to uh, run full power. Two of the sections are this particular section here, and its arc temperatures is too warm. But that may be how they're doing it now because they always crank this thing up slow, guys, to prepare to run maximum power. Now, it's important to understand this cryogenic thing, and that's got to do with cold temperatures, cooling something so cold that uh, it becomes a superconductor, superfluid almost, and that is very important to what we're about to talk about. Again, this is CERN. This is live. Now, let me change the subject slightly. Now, what you're looking at, and I think I mentioned it in a few videos ago, that uh, I was working on a PDF of some new information coming out that's pertinent, I think, both to biblical information, scientific information, and a lot of the things that people are reporting. It's, um, I don't know how people will take this data and, and uh, accept it. I remember when I first came out with a theory, which I knew it was true, but I had to present it as a theory that uh, solar flares caused earthquakes. Now it's a common theme. Ten years ago, though, I was attacked for that. I was also uh, thought to be out of my mind when I said that Comet Ison was going to split up and was not going to hit the sun, and it did exactly that. So I've put that same amount of uh, research into this, but I think this is probably the best gathering together of information for these end times. I titled it Cloaking and Planet X, but we're going to cover much more than that because no one's ever seen Planet X. I've never seen a picture of it. I've seen a lot of so-called pictures of it, but most of the time you can get through that 
and realize once you use common sense that if you could see it with your visual eyes or a cam regular camera, then um, it would be close enough to where we would see it on a daily basis. It wouldn't just be a lens flare here or there or something else. We're going to go into that and look at the possibilities because there is a possibility. There's, there's something out there that we cannot see. Why is that? Let's just uh, go through this information, guys. I kind of stacked it uh, in order, but just bear with me on here because it's an incompleted PDF, but I want to share what I have here. Now, I've pulled information from different data sources. Here, we're going to be using NASA. We're also going to be using the European Space uh, Union and we're different sources. And I will highlight where I interjected into uh, some of this type. Here from NASA, this is important. Pay attention to it. It says, many objects in the universe are too cool. Again, back to temperature, cryogenics, right? Too cool and faint to be detected in visible light. Think about that. They're there, but we can't see them with our eyes, but can be detected in the infrared, they're saying. Scientists are beginning to unlock the mysteries of cooler objects across the universe, such as planets. Listen, planets. Too cool to see with the human eye or with a basic telescope. Not only planets, but cool stars, like a dark star or possibly an object that's moving some of the uh, objects small planets and asteroids out in the Kuiper belt that we can't see again scientists are beginning to unlock the mysteries of cooler objects across the universe such as planets cool stars nebulae and many more by studying the infrared waves they emit and I'll put this section in it says let me add any type of spray uh, spacecraft guys and biblically we had chariots of fire and uh, days of darkness are part of this entire PDF so just bear with me here also just because it's not in the visible spectrum whether it's a planet spacecraft nebula like they're talking about up here a uh, cool stars does not mean it has no gravity or no mass which would affect other planets just like we're seeing some movement in the Kuiper belt I'll show you those models and no one's been able to see it, this object that's causing that is it because it's too cool we're going there let's first look at the electromagnetic spectrum so you'll understand deeper what I'm talking about and why maybe some of the great churches of the world and uh, other people are using infrared both space telescopes and earth-based infrared telescopes they're watching for something and these are nefarious organizations I'm talking about that are using this technology. Who or what are they watching for coming in a visible, in a not visible light spectrum? And that's why you're, we're going into the infrared. Now, you're looking at what's called water infrared waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, pay attention to the chart. You've got the from the purple to the red here, and these are in, uh, visible light frequencies or spectrums in that we see from here to here, if you got good eyesight. And that represents this very small narrow band, see right here, where they came in and then they expanded this chart out. You've got ultraviolet to the left, infrared to the right. We cannot see these. Doesn't mean they're not there. Again, doesn't mean they don't have gravity or mass. Now. There's different aspects of the infrared spectrum too, but again, once you come out of this band here and get into the sections of infrared, it's not visible by the human eye, not visible to a normal telescope. It's got to be an infrared, but guys, if they are already seeing the objects, more than likely we will not get to see those images just to say now someone could invest in a good infrared telescope, uh, ground base is it's going to make it more difficult because in the atmosphere the moisture in the our atmosphere creates a wave distortion that makes it hard to see in the infrared unless you're on a very high mountain like Mount Graham in Arizona which has a very large um, um, observatory guys that has what they call the Lucifer telescope that's a double binocular infrared thing so owned by Rome and run from the University of Arizona, if I'm not mistaken. By the way, Mount Graham was taken away from the 
Native Americans in that area uh, to build to build this project, and uh, it was a sacred mountain to them, by the way. You've probably heard of this, but anyway, they are looking not into this spectrum of visible light that we see, but into the infrared with that telescope. Now this chart is slightly different. Notice the visible spectrum here, the multicolors right there. That's not the part expanded. It is the infrared section, and that breaks down into the near infrared, which is right next to and telling the coloration of coming out of the visible spectrum into the infrared. But then the second section of infrared getting into the longer wavelengths is the mid wavelength infrared then the far infrared and this is what we're going to focus on is far infrared because it's important again i think this is going to tie both biblical data and scientific data into something that makes sense i hope now one thing i want to say we've got the new web telescope that's up there and they show beautiful images it's infrared we got other infrared telescopes up in space but guys all of that billions of dollars that have been spent on space and we do get beautiful images back but think about that is that really the reason that is that why the money's going into these projects and you know we're not going to see anything that we're not supposed to see while they're looking into the infrared do you think it's worth these billions or trillions of dollars to be honest with you to stargaze when there's nothing that we can do about it, think about it. They'll say, well, we want to look at the beginnings of the universe or whatever, right? Who cares? Who cares? There's nothing you can do, or any of us can do about any of that. They're doing something else. Now, from the European Space Agency, it says, relatively cold objects invisible to optical telescopes become visible in the infrared. Interstellar gas, again, planets, dust disk around other stars, asteroids, brown dwarfs or fell stars very well could be what we're dealing with in the Kuiper belt and stars being born are example of objects that are too cold too cold to shine in visible wavelengths but become conspicuous when viewed in the infrared direct infrared emissions from coal dust is feeble and the sensitivity of the ESA's Herschel mission played a key role in its observation but why go into space to do this? I'll just read it. It says, for two simple, important reasons. Earth's atmosphere blocks most infrared wavelengths. In addition, it also produces its own infrared radiation, overwhelming the celestial sources. But again, when you get up on top of these mountains, the atmosphere is very thin, like Mount Graham and the uh, Rome Telescope. So that's why they did that. Now, again, this has got to do with the wavelengths and the temperatures now this concept guys and it's very important to understand this it's talking about the emissions that come from an object in other words two objects can have the same size but have different emissions depending on what they're made of the composition and things like that it's important it says to understand the infrared emissions of objects this is a property of a surface that describes how its thermal emissions deviate from the ideal of a black body. To further explain, two object, objects at the same physical temperature may not show the same infrared image if they have differing emissions. For example, for any preset emissivity value, objects with higher emissivity will appear hotter and those with lower will appear cooler. Assuming, as is often the case, that the surrounding environment is cooler than the object being viewed. Again, space. Got to be a little cooler than that. We're going to look at those uh, examples. It says, when an object has less than this perfect emission, it obtains properties, listen, of reflectivity and or transparency. Now, I could have simply done the video with that one sentence or this one paragraph. Let's say that. Certain temperatures below the temperature of space and that can that is already proved possible and they're detecting them in infrared they are becoming either transparent or they are reflecting so transparency you would not see it you could see the stars in the background of an object doing this and I've added into the PDF that for th this could be the reason we see the Kuiper belt objects and not 
the object disturbing them. Let me pull this down. If there's an invisible planet or a dark star moving through the Kuiper Belt, and it has a lower emissive rate than the Kuiper Belt objects, even though the surrounding space temperature is the same. In other words, an object can be colder than space. And this section goes into who and what are they looking for. Rome has uh, put this together, and this is the Lucifer Telescope, stereo telescope lenses on the top of Mount Graham in Arizona. I think it's run uh, by the University of Arizona, in, uh, and they're in uh, league with uh, Rome and other agencies that are watching for something coming. Why is the Vatican looking into the infrared? You know, the Bible says the Lord can bring a host with him. Are they watching for something else? Now, what they're talking about, and this is open source, it says a new instrument with an evil-sounding name is helping scientists see how stars are born. I'm not sure that's exactly what they're looking for or not, but it makes sense that to use that excuse to drain people of millions and millions of dollars. The name Lucifer, which stands for Large Monocular Telescope Near Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research. Now, they had to really come up with a name to get that those abbreviated uh, words says it is a chilled instrument again chilled attached to a telescope in arizona and yes it is named for the devil whose name itself means morning star but it wasn't meant to evoke him according to a spokesman for the university of arizona now here comes this cryogenic thing again it says the instrument is chilled to a minus 213 celsius and about a minus 351 degrees fahrenheit that's to allow for near-infrared observations. The wavelength is important for understanding star and planet formation. Why is that important to us? God created it. Nothing you can do about it. They're watching for something, as well as observing very distant and very young galaxies. Again, they're not spending that money for this. This says Lucifer is part of the large binocular telescope, which happens to be right next to the Vatican Observatory on Mount Graham in Safford. That's right, the Vatican has an observatory in Arizona manned by Jesuit astronomers. Now its next door neighbor is named for the devil. Scientists at five German universities, they designed the instrument and they came up with the name. Remember a couple of years ago when they built that uh, tunnel in Germany and the sacrificial ritual it looked like that they were showing with uh, Angela Merkel and all that group there? So I doubt nothing gets past or I, I would put nothing past this group from Germany and uh, you know German the Ar German army in World War II said to have attained alien technology remember that so scientists at five German universities designed the instrument and they came up with the name according to Daniel Stolte a spokesman for the University of Arizona Stolt, who is German, explained that the term was tossing around names, or the team was tossing around names, looking for an acronym that would fit all the technical terms. Of course they did. How are we going to get the devil's name, Lucifer, into this telescope? Now let's go to one of the scientific charts about what well, they're calling Planet 9. Some call it Planet X. I think I'm going to stick with the invisible planet. And what they're showing is, here in the center, the complete solar system, all the way out to Neptune, right there, and of course, uh, Earth and the other, the inner solar system is inside of that. What they're showing here are different objects that are in the Kuiper Belt. Sedna is one of those. That's one of the largest. And they're showing that they're not orbiting around the solar system in a uh, very uh, systematic manner. They are very... Uh, elongated here see that and the scientists are saying they predicting that there's something they're not seeing in this orbit calling it planet planet nine that is causing these some of them are almost horizontal uh, or vertical orbits instead of horizontal orbits and that's what they're saying this has been studied and they're watching the movements of all of these planets out here and, and some of them are possibly asteroids but it's the Kuiper belt outside of ours and they're saying there's something affecting this now if, if we look at 
Now, I'd like to say that this would be closer to what I would project of something of an orbit of something, dark star, large planet, outside of our solar system that would affect the Oort belt, and it would be closer to this. Here you'd see the object on close approaching to our solar system. You would see a greater effect on the inner planets, the uh, electrical effect on our sun, magnetic electrical and uh, then as it moved back out into the Kuiper belt, you would see the distortion of the orbits that we're seeing right there. Instead of it being on this side, I would just change that to where it's looping through these arcs. I've seen comets do that before. Asteroids go out to Jupiter and around that area and bend back towards the sun. Now, how cold is space? It says it's only one degree warmer than absolute zero or zero on the Kelvin scale. It is the lowest temperature that is theoretically possible. Outer space has a baseline temp of 2.7 degrees Kelvin, minus 453.8 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 270.45 degrees Celsius. Now, CERN is dropping below this temperature, and they're doing it using helium. As a matter of fact, 40 tons it takes of helium to fill up all the valves and the pipes that keep these magnets below that temperature. So that same technology could be used in any type of craft to make it invisible, what I would call cloaking, because all of you guys know who Gene Roddenberry is from the ancient Star Trek books, right? Now, I think that people were handed knowledge, just like the German scientists, these authors of, of uh, science fiction, way before any of these things have come to be. I think that Gene Roddenberry is one of them. But notice in that, he talked about two things. There were um, ships that could cloak. They could disappear. They would become transparent. And the other thing was warp speed. Now, how would they become transparent? They could have the same cooling system that CERN has, helium, compressed helium, and it becomes a superconductor at that point. Now, if you're an object that's not only clear or transparent because you can maintain that cold temperature, then also your that ship or spacecraft could become a superconductor also. That would allow very fast travel, possibly near the speed of light or warp speed. Just bear with me here. Now let's go back to CERN for a moment just so we can look at the technology they're using. It says they're using helium and then it's cooled to 4.5 degrees Celsius minus 2.68 degrees Celsius using turbines. Once the magnets have been filled, the 1.8 K, remember this is below the 2 K of outer space, the 1.8K refrigeration units bring the temperature down yet further to 1.9 degree Celsius. Now, is CERN involved with all of this? I don't know. But I'm using the technology that they're using in a machine that's underground, much warmer than outer space, even though it's very deep. So, in an object out in outer space, to uh, achieve this 1.9 or below the infrared spectrum it would be much easier because your surroundings are cold. So if you use compressed helium in a spacecraft in a very cold environment, it would take a lot less and it would take a lot of less energy to provide that transparency. Then if you got into a warmer climate, like you entered close to the sun or entered Earth's atmosphere, the cloaking would either occur because you could really jack up your units of refrigeration to keep it down or that's when they would become visible thus if you had a fleet of starcraft again chariots of fire anything you want to name them i've seen 16 of them and the bible talks about them in a couple of different places if they were coming towards the planets the inner solar systems through the outer solar systems and if they were interfering with the kuiper belt they could maintain this technology to be invisible or transparent. But when they got inside the inner solar system, and especially into Earth's atmosphere, they would become visible, blocking the sun and the moon. Remember, it's four hours a day, four hours of night, eight hours of total darkness in that prophecy. That could be one thing that is very important to understand. What is Lucifer looking for? 
They want to know if trouble's coming, right? They have books of knowledge, guys, hidden in their museums that talk about so much more than we are uh, shown, so much more than we are able to read and understand that we have to do it this way. So they know this technology. They know that something's coming, and they're wanting to know where it is, how fast it's moving, which it could be very fast because it becomes a superfluid and a superconductor, any machine that's involved in this refrigeration. This is in total on CERN. The cryogenic system cools more than 36,000 tons of magnet cold masses. You would need that on a single craft, especially with your outside temperatures already very close to the 1.9K. Now, I want to end this section of it with the, this part, guys, and it's about uh, infrared cameras that you or I can use for Earth-based observations. And it's uh, actually talking about things like we see on Skywalker Ranch. If you've ever seen any of the episodes, I know a lot of it's Hollywood, but they've shown images looking into the old ranch section there. And this is just one instance of uh, the temperature inside the old ranch house at night getting very cold very quickly and it turned a dark blue on their cameras i've seen that several times and they're talking about possibly a skinwalker or a ghost and how many times have you heard people talking about a spirit or something they cannot see but the room became very cold you see where i'm going with this and it says that um, infrared cameras use infrared radiation of the electromagnetic spectrum to form images. It is similar to cameras we, or cameras we normally use. The only difference is that normal cameras use the visible light spectrum. Again, that's the one in the rainbow pattern. This type of camera is always used by ghost hunters when they investigate a haunted site at night. Now, we've you know, a lot of these are hoaxes or whatever, but infrared cameras are pretty accurate it says the most important reason for this is these cameras can work well into total darkness as the ambient light level does not matter this camera catches heat signatures which is simp uh, simply based on how hot or cold the body is thus making them best for paranormal investigations and that's what they're talking about atmospheric temperatures very low and cold in a room where people report they felt this coldness or in the examples of uh, the tv show i mentioned skinwalker ranch showing these very cold areas where they are detecting some movement or sound coming from that area and they've seen footprints and think about it, is that why we cannot see on the other side does it have something to do with the temperature another video for another time and there will be additions to this but i guys i appreciate you watching very much we're watching it. You watch it. It's a heads up. Be safe.